shocking start to the holiday road toll, with one triple fatality and another fatal head-on smash. Killed instantly when the tourist drove through a stop sign on Saturday, also injuring the driver, Shane Summerfield. And the police are expected to release a statement sometime very soon. He said that on the 31st of May, as he was driving his wife, daughter and her friend to Ohau for a holiday, he lost half his family. Family of a mother and daughter killed in an horrific road crash in Canterbury at Queen's birthday weekend have been heard in the Christchurch District Court this afternoon. Come here. Come here, you. And you. Oh, you good girl. Did you lose it? You coming? Come on. Kia ora koto. I am Dr Lucy Hone and I am the director of the New Zealand Institute of Wellbeing and Resilience. Come on, sweetheart. I live in Sumner, Christchurch. I have a master's in applied positive psychology, which essentially is resilience research and wellbeing science. Uh, the most important things in life for me are my family, friends and community. They are the, the bedrock of my life. I met Lucy in West London. I felt she looked nice. I, I liked her eyebrows. I believe Lucy and I are very lucky. We have a good relationship, live in a good community. We are lucky, privileged people, and we, we had a horrible experience. Abby. Um... Abby's character to me, I, I try and think how do I sum her up? She was feisty, she was very funny. Um, she was curious, bouncy and bubbly and you know everything that um, a 12 year old girl is. She looked lovely and then as a dad you are proud of that but I was more proud of the fact that she was a good bird. She wanted to write, she would write. I definitely think she would have ended up being a writer of some communicator of some description. Um, Sally Summerfield and I planned um, this weekend to go away together and we always wanted to go away and do things um, and um, um, Abby and Paddy were really really keen and Trevor and Ed not so keen so we'd all had a bit of a family row about it that morning I remember. It started in such a, a, a beautifully ordinary way of Abby actually going to watch her friends who were good at netball play netball. So she said, can I go with Ella? So yeah, absolutely, you can go with Ella. So we dropped her off at Hagley Netball Courts. And it was just, yeah, going to be a, a, a fun weekend. I think none of us had our cell phones around. We were all just having dinner. And then we realised somebody, we must, I don't know, actually, I can't even remember, but then we realised that we had a whole load of missed calls. We then get called to the office and get a phone call from a policeman. And I remember Trevor looking at me and saying, they don't come and give you good news, do they? So we knew then, I think, that it was obviously really bad. Subliminally, you know, they come to tell you, probably, that your daughter's dead. And that's just, you can't compute that. That doesn't make any sense at all, that in our normal, very privileged lives, that shit doesn't happen. Every family's worst moment for me. It was this intersection where the driver failed to stop, hitting the oncoming traffic, instantly killing the three female passengers in the car. And what police can't understand is that it all happened in conditions like what we've got here today. Then our life path split, really. And I, and I really remember that image when, when it all happened, of, the, of literally visualising this terrible divide in our lives that we were now going to be forced to go down a completely different path. Um, and and I've, I do feel like I kind of sense that whole horrible long journey, but at the same time thinking, that's it, no choice here, that is, you know, you don't see this coming, but that's where you're going, so um, let's, let's get on with it. And that's your new mission, really, is to walk that way. And this, that was the beginning of our new life. And that was a, a very long, surreal, painful day. But 
Yeah. The Dutch businessman Johannes Appelman last month admitted causing a car crash that killed Sally Summerfield, her 12-year-old daughter Ella and her 12-year-old friend Abby Home. I forgave him there and then. I don't think people understand necessarily the power of forgiveness um, and the, you know, the strength of it. So for us, um, it has enabled us to keep the driver as a bit part in that story um, and for us to take control of our own passage through grief. I remember saying to the boys, and possibly to myself, obviously he was to blame, but he wasn't evil. He was part of this hideous thing as well. There's really good research to show that community resilience is greater than the sum of its single parts. So meaning I can be resilient and you can be resilient, but actually the community together can enable greater resilience. After the, the accident, my initial response was just to start making food. And it turned into a six month roster of making food for both families. And the whole community got behind that and everyone contributed. Those first few days and weeks, I do remember thinking that I was kind of on, like on sort of autopilot where it felt like people would just have me by the shoulders and would go, go here, do this, go there, do that. Now you can go to bed. Our community was utterly fantastic and we are very, very fortunate to live in such a community. I set up in Lucy and Trevor's garage. I had the, I mean, it's all kind of, it seems crazy now, but I had the top of the coffin and I painted the top and I'd let it dry. And I had all these sheets of dots. But the lovely thing, and these things, it's amazing how they just happen spur in the moment, but people would come past and they said, can I put a dot on? It was just a really, it was a really emotional but lovely thing to do. Anybody from Christchurch will kind of get this as well, that when you're faced with a traumatic event that you are powerless to change, it really makes you feel so helpless that actually the human reaction to that is wanting to do something. So people are desperate to do something oh. to help. <laughs> Quite soon after the accident, Lucy mentioned to me that we were, among other things, prime candidates for divorce, given the, what we were going through. People do think that. People think that um, parental bereavement means that you're more likely to divorce. And actually, I've looked at the research and that's not true. I mean, that is absolute academic negligence. We both talk quite openly. And I think we, Particularly in the early, we grieved very openly. I, that's, to me, the only way to do it. Actually, bereaved couples are much more likely to stay together because you're the only people who really understand what you've gone through and going through. There are no rules to grief. You do whatever works for you as a couple, as a family, to survive. The rules are, does it work for you? And one of the things we so know from wellbeing and resilience research is that we're all different. So the way we process things is all different. So we all have to work out our own ways of thinking and acting that enable us to function as best as we can. After about, I think it was about a month, I went back to work. I needed a distraction from the ongoing uh, reality of, of, of Abby and all of that misery. But right. I went back to work probably too soon and I couldn't really cope. And then a couple of months later when I went back again, I was more prepared for it. And then suddenly it was a time in the day where I wasn't thinking about accidents and Abby and the futility of life. I, th I think I almost had an element of guilt. You can't just sit around doing nothing. Actually, if that's the best thing to do, then you can sit around and do nothing. You do whatever works. So um, on Queen's birthday weekend, we'd driven down three families and my wee girl, beautiful Abby, 12 years old at the time, hopped in the car with her best friend Ella, also 12, and the driver sped through a stop sign and killed all three of them. So 
I then started a completely new relationship with this material. Around the time of the very first earthquake in September 2010, I, had, I was just starting to think about doing a PhD. And so I went to visit Grant Schofield at AUT and the earthquake struck, the February quake struck. So he, I remember him phoning me saying, well, um, I'll come down um, to Christchurch and you and I will go and do a kind of resilience road show. What we know about well-being is that it's more than just happiness and feeling good. It's also about functioning well, being able to show up at work or school. And I also remember saying to him, no, 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 I don't do public speaking, you know. And I do remember Grant saying to me, Lucy, if you can't go and talk and share your knowledge with the little old ladies of Wynone Baptist Church, which was my first speaking gig, he said, then you're a Muppet. Okay, and the next question, and you can just shout out the answers to this. In two words, what do we want for our kids? Happiness? Peace? Love? Safe? Those things? Those things are well-being. I was really frustrated in those first weeks and months after the girls died by the kind of grief literature we were given. And so that led to me writing What Abby Taught Us. I wanted to give people strategies, ways of thinking and acting that I'd come across from um, resilience psychology, which I had found helpful in my grief. Thank you for asking me along today. And um, I've, got, I've got about 10 minutes for questions, actually. Do you want to ask questions or I can loiter? Who's got questions? Yes, hi. My relationship with Lucy, um, I'd probably describe it as one of mutual respect and admiration. You know, we've, we're kind of kindred spirits in many ways, so we've got a lot in common. Um, you know, both staunch members of the Sumner community, both psychologists, and both with our recent losses in our lives. Um, my husband Paul was just a really all-round um, likeable guy, actually. Like, he just seemed to gel with everybody. It was very positive, so I think that's what appealed to um, other people about Paul's character and, and to me as well, obviously. Sam, my son, um, was my eldest son, and he and I were very similar, so we had quite a kind of connection and knew what each other was thinking a lot of the time, but he was just a fun-loving, very sporty, very popular, very all-round young man. Paul said he passed away from pancreatic cancer on the 23rd of November last year. Um, his, his death was expected, but, um, you know, obviously really hard. But the shock of everything was Sam's death two weeks, two days later. Uh, from in totally different circumstances, so in a rafting tragedy on the west coast. Which, as you can imagine, was quite hard to believe. I put my head down on the table and just probably howled, you know. Yeah, so this um, stone in the middle here is from Palestine and it's um, to resemble Paul, so it's a really special um, stone that's been imported from Palestine. And then Sam sits in the middle, pride of place, and his is from um, Haast on the west coast where he lost his life, so obviously that's very meaningful. We gravitate here every morning and it's initially, no, every time, it's just a really nice feeling to walk along and sort of have a sense of, you know, Sam and Paul. I've always been someone who's sort of been quite fit and for whatever reason I quickly realised that what was going to get me through and keep me sane was to keep up that level of fitness, if not more, so I've called it the year of active grieving. 
exercise is proven to help with your mental health. I definitely would recommend exercise for anyone who is going through bereavement, but I wouldn't call it exercise necessarily, because really it's just a question of moving. The endorphins provided by, by doing exercise, I think the distraction, I think the, that quite often you're out in nature and just that ability to at least smell the roses and see, you know, that there is still life going on and yeah, I think exercise actually should be fundamental kind of prescription dealing with loss, yeah. I do feel by and large proud of how I've managed to keep going and what I've managed to actually achieve in the last year by way of lots of, um, quite a few events that we've had to really kind of mark Paul and Sam's passings in a meaningful way. So essentially this is the final fundraiser in um, a series that I've been doing in order to um, raise money for the Mental Health Foundation. I'm sure you're all here because it's such a worthy cause. I've taken a shining to event management and quite enjoying it actually so. We just remain eternally grateful for the fantastic support we've received over the last few months. Um, have an awesome night. It's looking good so far. Thank you very much. Julie raised enough money for 45 bikes for Kiwi kids like you. Humans have it. We have it within us to get through the most extraordinary and, you know, terrible times. The last sort of physical exercise event slash challenge of 2018 has been um, conquering the New York Marathon. Had a few tears across the finish line and, and I ran with them on my shirt. So, yeah, it felt really special. If Paul and Sam were here today, I would say I hope you guys are proud of how we've kept going and what we've managed to achieve and do in your memories. That's what I would say to them. I've learned that it is possible um, to live with grief and still um, have a happy functioning life, actually. And I don't know that I knew that that was possible. Accept the good, even in your darkest moments, there is still some good, and try and make the effort to identify it and find it, because without that, you do lose hope. Hope is a really important component, so just hoping that you will survive, hoping that we will stay together as a family has, is also really important. We've had great times in these last four and a half years. Um, we've had terrible times. But I've also learned that when enduring terrible times, you get to see the most extraordinary levels of human kindness and love too. And that's good.